of the week. Presenting the world premiere of an original motion picture produced especially for ABC. Tonight on the movie of the week. Hello again, this is Buck Benny speaking. Uh, I've done this before, kind of a, a night at the movies sort of thing. Uh, the problem is what I put together before, YouTube wouldn't allow me to, to air that, so I had to air it separately. So a lot of you, this would be your first time seeing us chat. Um, You've probably, maybe by now, maybe uh, it's, it's Zach is working on uh, a release of Winchester 73 that he and I talk about, and it's going to be his first kind of YouTube presentation of his show, which is Yesteryear Ballyhoo Review. I think I got it all right that time. Yes, you did. Congratulations. Sweet. I'll send you, I'll send you that ever. cookie ASAP. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, um, we're doing a... Uh, we're doing a video version, and um, the one thing I'm trying to currently figure out is if we're able to include the full film itself, or if we got to stick to the trailer. But regardless, though, we've um, I've found a way to make the show visual in a way that it might not otherwise be, right. and thankfully, Daryl's uh, participation uh, gave us some fabulous what ifs, but also. Um, because we get detailed, it makes sense that we can at least run non-audible footage of the film as we're talking about certain scenes. So we're going to be able to kind of see the scene we're talking about in question. Um, and, but so, but this, I think a lot of this actually, like the, the night at the movies that you uh, began with the Buck Benny trend ended up being a good guideline with how to approach it on my end for Ballyhoo. So it's 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 a treat to be a part of this particular intro too because we're talking about another western as well yeah exactly <laughs> so um oh, speaking of that i gotta put my hat on okay so uh <laughs> <laughs> there you go i love that hat <laughs> buck is back and, and ready ready to rumble about uh, uh our, our our famous uh western presentation here so uh at the uh we're, we've got a lot of ground to cover, so we're going to do it kind of fast because we know we got a lot that you're going to be able to see. As far as Zach goes with that, my the thing I do, Zach, and there's no, well, there's probably right and wrong to it somewhere. But, but anyway, I figure if someone's posted the whole movie or whatever and it's already sitting there on YouTube, that us talking about it and presenting it again is probably okay i don't know but it's like right if they haven't gotten it pulled and it's been up there for three years that they've had it up there i can't see how i can't have it up there as part of my so that's anyway my theory so all of this stuff everything you're going to see tonight is already on youtube somewhere but it's never been put together quite the way i'm putting it together tonight so what i did was everything you're going to see tonight is from 1939 we're sort of presenting it like if you went to the movies Back in 1939, you're going to get a, uh, a new, some newsreel footage that we're going to have of, of, uh, of, uh, and, uh, of Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney, and they're charming together, and I love that footage of them. Uh, that's from 1939. At least I think all that footage is from 39. It was labeled that way, so I'm going to assume that. Then, uh, then we're going to get a cartoon that... Uh, is from 1939 as well, the Warner Brothers cartoon. And in this cartoon, it has um, a, a variation, a, a play on Jack Benny's character, which is charming. And, and I didn't realize it was from 1939. So I'm like, oh, as a Benny fan, I'm like, that's great. I'd love to present that cartoon. And then uh, we're going to get into the Buck Rogers first chapter of his serial, because you would get a serial or cliffhanger type show if you went. And then we'll get into the main feature, which tonight is Stagecoach, and uh, just a wonderful film by John Ford with uh, uh, John Wayne in it, and Andy Devine does a beautiful job, and I'll talk a little bit about that as we go. Anyway, um, a chance for yeah, a chance for you to experience all that all that uh, wonderful uh, evening. I hope you're I hope you're going to enjoy it, and if you like it, and people seem to tune in and things, we'll try and bring you more of this sort of thing. So uh, let's just start walking you through a little bit. The first thing you're going to see is the newsreel uh, with Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney. I love how part of this newsreel footage that you're going to get shows you a little bit of the, the big thing in 1939 that I knew I wanted to somehow have in here. 
uh, which is the, the New York World's Fair, which was gigantic at the time. And they're at the World's Fair talking. Uh, what what I think this footage, this newsreel footage does, because it's, it's, it's a lot of, uh, it's like a multiple newsreel footage is put together. It's only four minutes long, the whole thing, but it's, you get a chance to see what an entertainer Mickey Rooney sort of was and how he'd keep things flowing and be able to, to come up with an idea of, oh, how can I make this interesting? And so he's like, oh, where can people stay? Do they have to stay in the expensive hotels and things? And, and, and is it the mayor he's talking to, I think, of New York? Uh, says, oh, no, we have lots of less expensive places for them to stay. Everybody should feel like they should come and experience the World Fair and all of that. It, he, he, he's good at throwing us some softball questions out there. And I don't know if they're things he made up or not. But And then the, the experience in the pool where they're, where they're going. And he kind of is jokingly diving in the pool and everything and, and kind of keeps the, the activities going. He's, he's a great little MC on the spot. And, and I love that. Um, and then the public service announcement that they have is kind of fun to see how that goes as well. So um, Kathy, um, did you have anything about, about that piece or, um, or no, just, no, I just about like, well, I, I'd like to, I'd like to thank you and praise you for this effort because we've come to just study films as um, single items and uh, the way people experienced them back when they were new, back in 1939, was the evening's entertainment. With everything, and I love how what you've put together for this presentation is the past, the future, the present, all the sort of movement and sort of conquering new uh, uh, exploring new areas and conquering new areas uh, of, of new topics that is uh, so much about what movies gave to uh, the American public. So thank you, Mickey and Judy are such uh, fabulous representatives of the excitement of Hollywood of 1939. So, right. uh, well, and as our Benny mm -hmm. person, Indeed. could you share a little bit about the... Uh, the cartoon, I mean, how did this strike you? Or ha have you watched this cartoon before or anything? Or um... Does Zach know anything? I didn't get a chance to watch oh, okay. <laughs> No, Zach, so, you got anything uh, to say about, about the cartoon before we move on to the yeah, thing? Well, um, Daffy and the Dinosaur is is a strange anomaly. Mm -hmm. um, and can everybody hear me okay? I just oh, want to yeah. make sure. You're fine. Okay. Yeah, it's a strange anomaly because it seems to divide Benny fans a little bit um, from what I gather. Um, for, for context, I took it upon myself to try and figure out what I could uh, for the Benny convention on Jack and animation. And there's not a lot mm -hmm. beyond just it being a reference point for animators at that time to reference pop culture, specifically at the Warner Brothers studio. Um, this is a Chuck Jones cartoon, although it doesn't fall strictly in the lines of what Chuck Jones would be most well known for by the time the mid forties to uh, all throughout the fifties approach. And it's the question comes, is this a Jack imitation? Uh, is this a Jack ripoff or is this just somebody who happens to sound like Jack? And the voice artist behind it is Jack Lascouli, uh, uh identified by the legendary Keith Scott uh, during our panel and um, during prep for the panel. Um, the schoolie was the go-to person for a Jack Benny imitation for the Warner Brothers Studios at this time. He is um, utilized in other cartoons from the Warner Brothers stock at this time than when they needed a Jack Benny. The schoolie would go on to be a very uh, instrumental part of the Today Show. Um, and uh, I think it's really a matter of interpretation. I tend to see versions of Jack's persona in the performance itself and not just the voice. However, yeah. the problem is, is that the main plot doesn't necessarily fall into a Jack Benny construct. It really is just a hunter who is teaming up with his dinosaur friend named Fido or his pet named Fido to get themselves a duck dinner. And um, in, in a lot of ways, it's interesting because I feel like it's one of the wackiest Chuck Jones cartoons I've ever seen because it's... Uh, it, it seems to adhere more to a, a Tex Avery style than it does to Jones's normal style. Um, it's not really couched in dialogue. It's couched in broader gags and uh, a lot more pop culture-y kind of aesthetic. Um, whereas I feel like 
Jones is more known for a little bit more of an artist streak attached to him. Um, he's not beyond pop culture reference, but he does definitely uh, try to keep it a little bit more in the Disney vein with his Warner Brothers spin. Right. Um, and I think the, the big thing you could take from it, honestly, is, is that if you listen to Lascouli's performance, he is at very least drawing off of Jack Benny tendencies with timing, drawing out certain gags or certain lines. Um, there is definitely the, like, you know, now come on. Like, that that would be a Jack-ism yes. during his earlier years with Rochester as well. Yes. Yes. Um, so I think it's something you could definitely attribute to the Benny camp. Um, at, but like, I mean, Laura Leibowitz has, has spoken out that she's not entirely sure that it's supposed to be a Jack Benny impression too. So I think we should always take those impressions that we put upon the art uh, as a, a grain of salt situation, because oh, we, sure. unless I can, unless I can dig up Chuck, Chuck Jones, we're not going to know, you know, <laughs> for me, I feel like it's a little bit like, um, it, it, it's it's a little it, it's fun in that it's a little bit of the Jack Benny universe crossing over into the Warner Brothers universe and the fact that it's Daffy Duck sort of with uh, what feels like a at least somewhat of a nod to the Jack Benny persona is is delightful and and I love that and it, whether it is that or isn't that it comes across as being that so and for a Benny yeah, fan it's Daryl what. Sure. What your collection for tonight also shows is that um, here are the movies are appealing to all different media and the audiences, especially young ones, would know the Buck Rogers cartoons in the Sunday paper. You know, and here it is on film. They would listen to Jack Benny on the radio and here it is in film. The Westerns had been out of film except for Saturday morning serials, Saturday morning right. Westerns for a long time. So for the adults. Uh, uh, you know, uh, watching this evening of the movies, here comes something from their youth again, uh, a revival of the Western. So yeah. I, I like how it shows that uh, movies at the time really did draw on all facets of media and popular culture. Oh, exactly. And then uh, just because you brought up the, we'll, we'll hop into the Buck Rogers, the, the, the serial we're going to present, and if we do this again, we'll present always just part one of a serial, just so you know, from that vintage. So this is from 1939. But in the show notes down below, if you check down below, uh, I will connect you up so that you can watch the entire T of, of all the parts of the of this Buck Benny presentation. It's out there on YouTube. And and uh, it's fun to watch. Bus I love Buster Crab. I loved him as Flash Gordon. This is the first I've actually seen him play uh uh, Buck Rogers and it's fun to see him play Buck Rogers. I watched the 1970s uh, television show Buck Rogers when I was a kid and so it's fun to see this interpretation and uh, it, it's fun to in your head kind of compare all the versions of Buck you've seen in the past. In this case again he's someone supposedly from the current time frame at the, at the time you know and who uh, got through suspended animation ends up 500 years in the future and how he would react to that. And this is sort of the, the piece where you see how that all transpires. It's it certainly, uh, the, all these serials are, are kind of funny to watch back at, at the time and see how they how they do this and see how the science doesn't really make sense and things, but you just gotta kind of let it go and just go for the ride. And what a cool ride these cliffhangers were with every week being uh, what's going to happen now and you got to come tune back in so we can get people back in the theaters or try to get them come back uh to see all the different parts of this serial and uh, uh just it's a delightful serial and and i was looking at the ratings of it compared to some other serials and things and it's pretty high i mean they rated on imdb as like seven out of ten and that's about as high as a serial gets a lot of the serials are like three out of ten or something because some of them aren't so good but this one is one of the better ones so i hope you enjoy that and now well let's just dive into the movie since we've only got a few minutes left and i want to kind of keep these intros a little bit short um for the movie my part that i'm just going to mention really briefly is i love andy divine andy divine is is on the Jack Benny show, always referring to, to Jack as Buck because he plays, Jack plays the character of Buck Benny when he's on. And it's fun to hear Andy Devine have the name Buck in this uh, movie. It just gives it a little more of a little tie-in for Jack Benny fans. And just what struck me, and, it, and it's just silly, but it's like 
the way he led those horses and would and would know their names and talk about the, the different horse names, I was thinking back, I was going, how many times have I seen in Westerns somebody leading your, and have I ever had them ever refer to the name of one of their horses? The only team I can think <laughs> of that anyone refers to the names of the horses are uh, Santa Claus and talking about, about about his reindeer, <laughs> Don Dash or on Dash or, uh, or Dancer, right? But this is sort or of like or, that. Or, or, or go trigger ahead. the horse, yeah. You know, yeah. trigger the horse. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. There you so go. yeah. So I was just delightful that that he kind of did that and it kind of made it seem more real or more it just made you care about the character. And he, he's such a loving guy. The other thing about this movie is just how many wonderful character actors are in here. Um, oh, and and one more piece I was gonna mention, then I'll toss it over to Zach because I know he'll have a, probably lots to share about it. But the um when Ringo, it's it's Johnny Ringo, right? Is 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 uh, his name, the right? Ringo is, Kid, is, yeah. Is the character yeah. Ringo Kid? Okay. Anyway, so Ringo Kid. So so when we see him, the the John Wayne character show up for the first shot. It's a very dramatic shot. It's a very uh, cinematic shot that people have referred to lots of times. I never realized, but when we see him, if you watch in uh, Avengers: Infinity war when we when the with the very first scene where we see captain america it's very similar to this i can't believe that they weren't somehow basing it a little bit on this the reveal that they have of of him to come and save the day and the reveal that you have of um uh, ringo kid in this in this piece is very similar in how they how they're done and so those are fun to watch and compare the two anyway but let's go to zach zach um, just a, if you can give me just a few minutes on what you think they are some of the highlights of this film and what are the things that make it great I think it, I think in a broad scope is the best way that I could describe stagecoach because there, there's a staging of action and cho choice of delivery that set it apart from other westerns like we are keeping it primarily like bound into this confined area um, but I think the big thing to take away from this is that it's one of the first Westerns that has a much more character-driven perspective and less about the spectacle. Mm -hmm. um, Stagecoach innovates a layering of the Western mythos that didn't necessarily exist prior. And, and there's, a, there's an opposite end spectrum of this with Union Pacific coming out the same year, which has a similar bent to it. But there are two films on, on opposite ends of the spectrum that provide a revitalization of the Western that up to that point had been kind of relegated to B-movie status or um, uh, had been out of fashion. And keeping in mind that the Western genre has been here as long as the movies themselves have existed because it's their closest connection culturally, especially on the West Coast to uh, events you'd want to see on screen that portray something that's been experienced. Um, it, it's, it's our oldest genre. The Great Train Robbery alone, like, cements that idea. Um, <clears throat> but it, additionally, too, it's a film that it doesn't come out of one of the major, major studios. It's coming out of Walter Wanger. It's coming out of Ford deviating from his normal studio bent. And I find it fascinating to watch production companies outside of the studio, the full studio system, like that, the, the established majors that we are all familiar with and to see what they come up with more often than not. Um, and this is the film really like, I mean, I am not the world's biggest John Wayne fan for full disclosure to the audience. Right. However, this is the movie that makes John Wayne, John Wayne. This is yeah. his, this is, this is his movie. The ring uh, Ringo is a, when you that opening shot of Ringo that pushes in on him when he's when he's flipping the gun around, yeah, it's iconic. It it enters John Wayne into the movie business and into the American consciousness for all time as a result of it. Um, and it's undeniable that you know you can't not look at Stagecoach as monumental for a, a, a lot of reasons. But I think it's that it's the film that really gives us the Wayne mythos. It yeah. starts us out. And the, the movie also is, especially in a world where the code is strictly enforced, this movie's really racy. This movie's really racy for its time. 
yeah. um, and for its for its specific year too. Uh, this seemed to be a year where a lot of buttons were pushed because you also have like a film that I'm not too fond with that won Best Picture that year, uh, Gone with the Wind, pushing the 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 good taste with the word damn. You know, th- this is a this is a year that innovates a lot from the fantasy genre with Wizard of Oz on down to the to the epic drama with Gone with the Wind to the mystery film with Hounds of the Baskervilles, and Stagecoach falls perfectly in there as a film that solidifies what the western is supposed to be right it's like this is what the western genre is as we know it from a traditionalist well, for, standpoint Zach, it comes from for this. instance the uh i don't know if we get winchester 73 without this film exactly i think it lays and the groundwork for, either. what was that without him so. yeah without him that's right that's right <laughs> yeah no yeah it, it no you're you're right it we don't get you don't have an attempt by studios to try to keep the Western genre revitalized at any given point without something like Stagecoach setting the template for this can be a prestige picture, this can be a box office moneymaker, uh, this can elevate the careers of people who attach themselves to it. Right. You know, for well, I think for it, to me, it was probably- this film and then a Red River becomes one mm-hmm. on the, along that line and then after that with with the uh with, with like we were saying that the anthony mann westerns with uh jimmy stewart i think that leads to the creation on radio of gunsmoke because of these serious westerns and they're trying to do the same thing yeah. in radio which leads to the television show of gunsmoke which leads to all the westerns the, the, this is a catalyst for so much in radio, television, film, that it can't be overstated as to just what an influence this film is on so many things. And it's a delight to just watch and enjoy the, the scenes where they're in, so much of it is in the, the uh, what, the, the stagecoach itself, hence the name. And the, the amount of people they can have in that little confined space and the different camera angles and shots they can get in there, that's a tremendous feat in and of itself to, to be able to pull that off. I mean, and the fact that John Wayne comes in and he sits on the floor of the stagecoach and yet commands the, st- it, it, you know, that's a position of, uh, of being less or smaller than the other characters it would look like, but his character is so big and overpowering that he, he takes over that stagecoach anyway, even by just sitting on the floor of the stagecoach. Um, I think that's that's wonderful. So anyway, Zach, what? Um, oh, I, I was I, I was going to bring up because you brought up Infinity War, and yeah. um, uh, it's and far be it from me to not try to uh, connect it to the present here, as is my well to do. Um, you know, the Western genre up until a certain point was seen the way superhero films are seen now. Right. Um, I would agree. There have been exceptions like Joker and Black Panther that have broken the norm of what can be nominated for Best Picture. Mm -hmm. Um, And in a sense, maybe we're in the early burgeoning era of the superhero genre becoming a legitimate genre from a certain perspective, I I think it's just as solidified a genre as any genre in cinema. I think that it, but it still has, it has its detractors because of what it is supposedly doing to the film industry at large. And there are bigger issues surrounding that. Beside the point, I won't belabor that point. What I will say is, is that Stagecoach does for the Westerns what Black Panther and, uh, and to a certain extent Joker do for superhero films. It's solidifying it as a legitimate genre in the eyes of both the artistic community and in the movie going public. Because up to this point, the Western genre is seen as a filler and a reliable moneymaker, but it's not like, but nobody takes it as seriously as Ford does. And Ford really is one of the reasons that this genre is able to continue even into the 50s. Because he still keeps making them. He still keeps making them even though, um, I mean, now granted, he has a, a bit of a spell where he's doing more stuff at Fox that's more driven towards uh, uh, politi- politically charged discussions such as uh, labor, 
labor force unions and uh, the depression with Grapes of Wrath and How Green Was My Valley um, and World War II, especially with they were, they were expendable. But he jumps right back into it with other films that lead into his big run in the 50s, which include, amongst other things, The Searchers. Right. But Stagecoach is the reason that we can even have this 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 yeah. this thing to look back on and i would i would venture to say that stagecoach played a lot on television along with other westerns that then led to the big boon that you have in the 50s especially in the early to mid 50s of westerns being made on a wide cinema scope range to compete with reshowings of movies as solid as stagecoach correct and I think Kathy mm -hmm. had something to throw in there, so let's swing over well, to Kathy. Well, please. well, I, yeah, um, uh, John. Well, there are so many things. Um, <laughs> I loved the I loved the odd trailer you found for Stagecoach mm -hmm. that is that starts with airplanes and ships and trains and things like that. It's like reintroducing the Western as a valid topic. And, and then they connect it to pushing people out into the um, a new territory of the West. Um, which is, you know, kind of not what the film is about. But as I said, but that idea of saying fabulous director John Ford, who's brought you the informer. So just as you say that um, they're represented as a brand new thing and John Wayne is a brand new star. Wayne had been in movies for nearly 10 years and yeah. John Ford had been in movies for more than 20 years at this point. So just as as you, Daryl and Zach, have said that um, uh, Stagecoach represents so much of a sort of tabula rasa or let's do it over again on the big screen, connecting it to an almost uh, sort of Shakespearean connection of, of characters. But uh, uh, it, so it's just such a fabulous film. But John, John Ford would not have been possible without a character who plays the drunk bartender halfway through the film. His older brother, Francis Ford, oh, who was in some mm -hmm. of the earliest Westerns from 1909 and the fabulous Ince Bison films of uh, 500 cavalry and 500 Indians and uh, 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 chasing each other across the uh, Santa Monica Canyon area. Uh, his, older, his older brother, 12 years older than him, had truly helped invent the Western wow. and taught his younger brother, trained him for four years. Uh, John Ford goes on to make his mark, his earliest features, were with Harry Carey, who John Wayne modeled himself after as kind of that stoic, not, you know, not a Broadway cowboy, that, uh, that sort of stoic lone figure. So there is both so much history in this movie about film history and, make, and the Western myth on screen, as well as all being presented new. In, uh, in this marvelous film that it's, it's just terrific. So, well, that is so why I wanted Francis to present Ford this as our first shows up. Here he is. He had, he had been in, in 1939, Francis Ford had been in the movies 30 years. Wow. And, uh, so mm -hmm. it's, it's the movie's past as well as present in a mythical, uh, a, a mythical West. So. Yeah. Wonderful. And that's, that's the, my whole reason for bringing this and, and the, uh, the, the trailer, as you say, I thought it was a really interesting trailer as well. It's really cool. So, mm -hmm. so I'm that'll be presented too before we hit the film. Uh, because I was thinking, of course, they would show previews and things, trailers for other films. Now, in this case, we're going to see a trailer for its own film, what you would never normally see. But I just think it's it's, it's keeping with the idea that you would see a trailer. It's just you're going to see a trailer that you would never see with the actual film. So, uh, but that's okay. Um, and so overall, I think you're in for an interesting night at the, at the movies. And I think we'll... Uh, stop it there and let you just enjoy it i if you if you ever want to go into movies in depth where maybe they're talked about like for three hours and, and really analyzing the, the the power of film i would really highly suggest you go to one of zach's um uh, podcasts that he has they're they're terrific i was involved in one of them but he has so many great guests and i've, I've been listening to a lot of them and just really enjoying them and they're a lot <laughs> of fun and that's that's the uh yesteryear uh bally who oh my review last yesteryear bally yes review. review yes yeah it's wonderful that, people will get it eventually until then i'll always be there to remind them yeah <laughs> no um yeah it, we we've talked about westerns prior to we did the searchers um with ford and um and i guess as a full disclosure we're not very kind to ford or wayne 
for obvious reasons, but um, we're, we're as about as fair as people can be. Uh, the Winchester 73 discussion with Buck, I think, is the most uh, elevated and uh, like uh, like complimentary discussion on the Western genre because we're talking about Anthony Mann, who had a little bit more of a humanist approach as we were discovering. Um, but we also did cover Buck Benny Rides again, too. So not quite a Western, but it is a Western in a lot of ways. Right. Um, you know, we, 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 we cover the gamut on the show. <laughs> That's right. They, and he does. And, yeah. and, and you'll hear lots of commentary on lots of different movies. It's, it's a delightful piece. And uh, mm. he, the, as we said, Winchester 73 is going to be the first kind of out there on YouTube sort of thing with with it and and hopefully hey. he'll be bringing more things to YouTube uh cuz I think that's that's a whole other that's the plan that enjoy. Yeah. yeah yeah so anyway we'll we'll end there thanks everybody enjoy this whole night at the movies and definitely enjoy stagecoach it's definitely worth your viewing so we'll see you folks next time thanks everybody world today, adventure takes wings. Planes shuffle across the country at amazing speed. Man has raced around the earth in less than four days. Planes roar at 400 miles an hour. Airships, streamlined trains and buses speed thousands to new frontiers. Yet well within the span of our memory, the streamliner of its day, the American stagecoach, crossed the uncharted rugged west, bringing new people to a new country. What fascinating stories there were in the life of the stagecoach and in the lives of its courageous passengers who found romance in danger and understanding in strange companionships. From the adventures of these American frontier characters, John Ford has created a truly great motion picture, Stagecoach, a drama as forceful and as true as the informer and as gripping as the hurricane. You all hear what the lieutenant said? What are you trying to do? Scare somebody? If you'll take my advice, ma'am, you won't take this trip. My husband is with his troops in Dry Fork. If he's in danger, I want to be with him. All right, folks. Hey, Curly! Why don't you take the cuffs off the kid? He's mighty handy with the gun. You drive them horses. I'll take care of the kid. The man works all his life to get a hold of some money so that he can enjoy life and has to run into a trap like this. Trap, brother? You mean the Apaches? There's been no sign of them. You don't see any signs of them. They strike like rattlesnakes. You talk too much, Gatewood. Don't, Fritz, don't say Take me. it easy, you... Gatewood. We may need that fight before we get to the ferry. You wouldn't be much good in a fight, you jailbird. Oh, leave the kid alone. He's handcuffed. We can go ask him to marry him. Is that wrong for a girl like me? If a man and a woman love each other, it's all right, isn't it, Doc? Don't you know that boy's headed back for prison? Besides, if you two go in the Lord's bed together, he's got to know all about you. You didn't answer what I asked you last night. Look, kid, why don't you try to escape? I gotta go to Lordsburg. Why don't you go to my ranch and wait for me? Wait for a dead man. Screen star Judy Garland cuts her birthday cake at a party given by film chief Louis B. Mayer and attended by Hollywood's younger set, including irrepressible Mickey Rooney. In movie land, eating means exercise. So the pride of the Hardys, Olympic champ Marjorie Gestring and Jackie Cooper decide to race with Judy as starter. Get on your mark! 
Get set. Go. The boys are pretty good to give Marjorie such a battle. In Mickey's day in the swim by a thin splash, making him master of ceremonies. Say, kids, don't you think it would be a good idea if Marjorie gave us a few dives? <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Right, how about it, Marjorie? Sure thing, Mickey. Atta girl, it'll take some diving to beat that. Kids, my, uh, my first dive will be a full soldier duct, a half old. Watch. <laughs> Springboard technique a la Rooney. Look out below. Mr. Mayor, um, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Go ahead, Mickey. Well, I have a lot of friends around uh, out where I live out on the coast, and they'd like to come and visit the World's Fair, but I want to ask you if there's any place that they can stay other than the Park Avenue hotels. Why, sure, Mickey. New York City's like every other town in this country, except that we can give you a better accommodation and better food for less money. <laughs> now, they can come here. Now, Judy, you have friends, too, haven't yes, you? Yes, I have. Now, you can tell the boys and girls, the high school students, that they can come to New York and get accommodations, safe, sanitary, cheerful, inspected rooms, all the way from 50, 75 cents a night. And if they come in groups, we can give, the, give to them as cheap as 50 cents a night. Oh, and Mr. Mayor, that looks like we're going to move in. <laughs> you better <laughs> not. You move in, you tell the kids, and hey, what do you think of this fair? Isn't it great? It's really wonderful. Isn't it fine? I'm going to give mine to President Roosevelt. President? Why, well, Mickey? Yes, you see, Judy, I've got my envelope made out right here. It's all ready to go. See for yourself. Oh, I know. That's a march of dimes, the infant paralysis fund. That's right. And, Judy, when I spend a dime on myself for some little luxury like this, I always think about those unfortunate kids and how far just a dime will go toward helping. Gee, Mickey, we don't know how lucky we are and how much we have to be thankful for with our health and our happiness. Judy, and that's why we should do all that we can to help all of those who can't help themselves. I know. Can I put a dime in your envelope? Oh, you know that you can. And that's what every good American should do. Join the March of Dimes. Send yours to President Franklin Roosevelt in the White House. Washington, D.C. <laughs> Westmore Observatory, calling dirigible Shandro. Westmore Observatory, calling dirigible Shandro.
not scared, are you, buddy? Well, I guess I was a little scared before you got above that blizzard. Keep a secret? Yes, sir. So was I. <laughs> well, I'm still scared. What for? We're up so high we can hardly breathe. We're about to run out of oxygen. Westmore Observatory, calling dirigible Chandro. All right, flying too low now. Think on any more ice and snow? Calling dirigible Chandro. Westmore Observatory, calling dirigible Chandro. Good, they finally found us. Braden, take the controls. Dirigible Chandro answering. Go ahead, Westmore. I've contacted Miss Buck's voice. Hello, Chandro. Is that Lieutenant Rogers speaking? Buck Rogers to you, Professor. Hello, Dad. We're having a swell time. Are you all right, Buck? Where are you? Okay so far, sir. Still riding above the blizzard. What's your exact position? Can't say. Within about 300 miles, sir, on account of drift. Holding about 40,000 feet elevation. Have to stay here until we ride out the storm area. I think we can do it. Breathing is getting hard. Running low on oxygen, sir. I'm going to drop down a couple of thousand feet. I've got to have there. Throw our ballast. We're losing altitude. We're going down where we can breathe. Are you fool? We're loading down with ice. Maybe too late now to get this weight. Professor, we've dropped down into the storm. Buck's trying to climb out, but he can't make it. What are you going to do? Bail him up before we crash! Stop him, Mitchell. He'll freeze to death before he lands. Now it's better than tying him here like rats. Do you think there's any chance for them, Professor? I'm afraid they're likely to crash, but there is one chance. Hello, buddy, can you hear me? Yes. Then listen carefully. Do you remember that tank of Nibano gas I put aboard just before you took off? Yes, sir, I do. If you're forced down, will you promise me to turn the lever on that tank as far to the right as you can, buddy? Yes, sir, I will. No, I don't get it. Uh, what is Nibano gas? It's a recent discovery of the professors, uh, a gas that induces suspended animation. Suspended animation? Well, that's a lot of hokum, isn't it? Like, uh, perpetual motion and show it. You see that dog? He's been in there nearly three months. Huh. What's strange about that? He's dead, isn't he? He's neither dead nor alive for the time being. do come to life. Here, be with his heart. Why? It's starting to beat. I put a tank of that gas aboard the Chandro as a precautionary measure. If they were forced down in some inaccessible spot, I hoped it would sustain their lives until relief ships could rescue them. What is it, buddy? Buck says we're going to crash. Go goodbye, Dad. Ask Buck for his approximate latitude and longitude. Buck, Professor Morgan wants to know your approximate latitude. What's happened? Hello, Chandro. Hurt bad, buddy. Hello. Hello. Sandro just crashed. Give me your latitude and longitude and turn on the Navano gas. Gas is turned on, sir. Latitude. Latitude about 70 north, sir. Longitude. Longitude.
You were right, Lacey. It's the remains of some ancient type of spaceship. Wonder why we never saw it before. I've flown over this place a hundred times. It's probably covered with ice most of the year. Let's take a closer look. We'll use our disintegrator pistols. Some sort of gas. <laughs> Certainly is an antique. They're in a perfect state of preservation. Must have been frozen since the ship crashed. Almost natural temperature. Let's get them out of here. This gas is making me drowsy. Well, uh, take hold of us, Pete. Why? He's alive. Sure, I'm alive. What's wrong with you? Uniform. Buddy. Yeah. Buddy, step out of it. Uh, he's all right. Professor Morgan's gas sure did the trick. <laughs> How long have you been looking for us? Why are we weren't looking for you? Well, that doesn't make any difference. You found us anyway. I think we'd better take him to Professor Cure. Our patrol ship is beyond that point of rocks. Now, now wait a minute. March. at least a hundred years ahead of anything I ever saw. I wonder how fast we're going. About a thousand miles an hour at least. Polar Patrol calling operations office. Polar Patrol calling operations office. Operations office. Go ahead, Polar Patrol. Golly, they sure dial in quick. Put this call through to scientist General Hewer. It is urgent. One moment. Go ahead. Captain Rankin speaking. We're approaching the city with two prisoners, found in a dirigible. A dirigible? That's impossible. Such ships haven't been used since the 20th century. 20th century? What does he mean? I don't know. The ship was frozen in the tip of Bering Glacier. The prisoners were in a state of suspended animation when we found them. Bring them directly to me when you land. That is all. General Suspect, sir. You're to come directly to his headquarters. 
Thank you, Lieutenant. Come along, men. So what kind of an elevator is that, anyway? By radioactivity, it breaks down the atoms of the body to their component parts. And reversing polarity reassembles them wherever desired. Take my place, Lieutenant Deering. Follow our spaceship through the televi. How did you come to be in that dirigible? I was in command. We'd taken off from New York and were making a transpolar flight around the world when... Uh, what year was that? 1938. 1938? Impossible. Let me verify that. Nineteen thirty-eight. Uh-huh. There was such an expedition. Uh, your name, please. Buck Rogers. Uh, Lieutenant Rogers, officially. And yours, my boy? My name is George Wade, but I'm usually called Buddy. Nirvana Gas. That explains it, then. Rankin, we are witnesses to a scientific miracle. By means of a gas discovered by Professor Morgan, these two people have remained in a state of suspended animation for 500 years. 500 years? That, that makes me old enough to be my own great-grandfather. But, Professor Hewer, that's impossible, sir. Dr. Hewer, Killer Kane has captured another of our pilots. <laughs> Save yourself considerable discomfort by telling me where to find the entrance to the hidden city. I do not remember. I think I know a way to make you remember. Look into that instrument. Look into it. Those men were once pilots of Dr. Hewer's ships. Now they are living robots. Men robbed of all willpower while they wear the helmets I had designed for them. Shall I have you measured for a robot's helmet? Or will you tell me where the entrance to the hidden city is? I do not remember. Take him away! I, I don't understand, sir. Uh, who is this man called Killer Kane? He is the result of the stupidity of the men of your century. You failed to stamp out lawlessness, and at the end, the criminal became stronger than the law. Racketeers, you call them. Today, they rule the world as cruelly as they ruled their gangs in your day. Well, isn't there any chance of help from an outside source? Well, only from men on some other planet. Another planet? <laughs> that doesn't sound very hopeful. It could be. But our spaceships seem unable to, to slip through Kane's air blockade. We've lost five thus far trying it. You mean you actually have ships that can travel from planet to planet? Of course. And if you have ships that can travel that far, you know, I think I know a way of running that blockade. Well, if you have any plans, I'm ready to listen to them. But to me, it seems much hopeless. Am I right, Marshal Craig, in assuming that you can operate a plane from the ground at such a distance, mind you, by means of radio? That's correct, Rogers. Well then, sir, why don't you send up such a ship as a decoy? While Kane's patrol is following it, I can slip through in a spaceship and get help from Saturn. We've already lost too many ships and crews. We can't afford to try it. It seems to me you can't afford not to try it, sir. Rogers is right, Marshal. 
Unless we get help from Saturn, our cause is lost. Very well, sir. You're in charge. Thank you very much. Lieutenant Deering, you will go with Rogers to establish a means of communication with Saturn, if you do get through to that planet. Patrol ship 74 calling 60,000 foot patrol. Shall I lay our course directly for Saturn now, Buck? May as well. Hey, Buck, look. They fell for it, all right. How can they fly that spaceship with no one in it? We can direct all the aircraft from the control room until they reach the outer atmosphere. I don't think we'll run into any more trouble. Why don't you take a nap, Wilma? I'll, I'll take the controls. Thanks very much. Set up ahead. Looks like a gray wall. That's the outer atmosphere of Saturn, buddy. It's ten times denser than the air around the Earth. What was that? I don't know. Oh, it's two of Killer Kane's ships coming up fast behind us. Charge your speed to one half. If we do, they'll get away from us. Don't worry about that. They'll either have to slow down or go up in smoke. Retarding rockets. If we enter that atmosphere at this rate of speed, the friction will bring us to a crisp. Look, they smash the rockets. I can't fire them. and the oxygen tanks. If they explode, we'll be born to atoms. What do you think the controls? The portholes are giving way, Buck. That's no use. The heat is melted at the valve heads. It's a move, buddy. There's only one hope for us. Climb above this atmosphere back into outer space. a saber-toothed tiger. Well, anyway, half a one. Well, 
this isn't getting me breakfast. Here, Fido. <laughs> Now, come on, I'm famished. Well, I'll bet you're cranky before breakfast, too. Be quiet. Mm. Yum, yummy. My favorite vegetable, duck. acts like he's crazy. That is correct. Absolutely 100% correct. So that's the way it is, eh? All right, then. Cavemen get to go swimming, but I never get to do anything. Well, what are you looking at? Don't just stand there. Do something. Now go get it. The big lummox. <laughs> Never took a lesson in his life. <laughs> Wait here. what I wanted, a duck breakfast. Gee, I can hardly wait. Come on, Fido.
almost there. Maybe that wasn't such a hot idea after all. Good night, folks. Here full of Apaches. They weren't ever ranch building in sight. He had a brush with them last night. Says they're being stirred up by Geronimo. Geronimo? How do we know he isn't lying? No, uh, he's a shy hand. They hate Apaches worse than we do. Clear the wire to Rothberg. That's Lawsburg now, sir. They seem to have something very urgent to tell you, sir. Well, well what's wrong? The line went dead, sir. What do you got there? Only the first word, sir. Geronimo. <laughs> You better get out and stretch your leg. I mean your limbs, ma'am. We're going to change horses here. Is there a place here where I can have a cup of tea? Well, yes, ma'am. You can get a cup of coffee at the hotel across the street there. Thank you, driver. Uh, you look a little drunk. I'll be all right, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Why, Lucy Mallory. Nancy. How are you, Captain Whitney? Fine, thanks, Mrs. Mallory. Why, whatever are you doing in Arizona? 
I'm joining Richard in Lordsburg. He's there with his troops. He's a lot nearer than that, Mrs. Mallory. He's been ordered to drive forth. Why, that's the next stop for the stagecoach. You'll be with your husband in a few hours. Oh, I'm so glad to see you, Lucy. Sit down, darling. We'll have a cup of coffee. You must be tired from that long trip. Who is that gentleman? Hardly a gentleman, Mrs. Mallory. I should think not. He's a notorious gambler. Hello, Mink. Hi, D. Frank. Well, Marshal, I'm looking for my shotgun guard. Is he here? How with the posse, Buck? Trying to catch the Ringo kid. Ringo? I thought Ringo was in the pen. He was. Busted out? Well, good for him. I guess the kid's aiming to get even with them plumber boys. Does that testimony sent him to the penitentiary? Well, all I gotta say is that he better stay away from that there Luke plumber. Why, gosh, Luke's run all of Ringo's friends out of Lordsburg. For the last trip there, I seen him hit a rancher on the head with the barrel of his gun, and, well, he just laid it wide open like a butchered steer. You seen Luke Plummer in Lordsburg? Yes, sir, Reed. You boys take care of the office for a couple of days. I'm going to Lordsburg with Buck. I'm going to ride shotgun. Oh, gosh, if I could learn to keep my big mouth shut. Here's the payroll, Mr. Gatewood. You know, ever since I opened this bank, I've been trying to tell those people to deposit their payroll six months in advance. It's good, sound business. It's good business for you, Mr. Gatewood. Sir, there's your receipt, $50,000. And remember this, what's good for the banks is good for the country. Because I ain't paid your rent. Is this the face that wrecked a thousand ships and burned the towerless tops of Ilium? Farewell. Fair Helen. Doc. Doc, can they make me leave town when I don't want to go? Do I have to now, go? Now, Dallas, don't you go making no fun. Do I have to go, doctors? Because they say so. Now, Dallas, I've got my orders. Don't blame these ladies. It ain't them. It is them! Doc, haven't I any right to live? What have I done? We're the victims of a foul disease called social prejudice, my child. These dear ladies of the Law and Order League are scouring out the dregs of the town. Come on. They are proud, glorified dregs like me. You get going, Doc. You're drunk. <laughs> Two of the kind. Just Two of the kind. Take my arm, Madame la Comtesse. The tumbril awaits for the guillotine. Oh, wait till I get my badge, girls. I'll join you. If ever you go east, brother, come out to our house for dinner. No one in all Kansas City, Kansas, sets a better table than my dear wife, Violet. Jerry. Yeah, Doc. Jerry, I'll admit as one man to another that economically I haven't been of much value to you, but suppose you could put one on credit. If talk was money, Doc, you'd be the best customer I got. <laughs> I'm leaving town, Jerry. Honest? Yes, old friend, and I thought you might out of memory of our many happy... All right, Doc. Just this one. Thank you, Jerry. Here's a man going on the stagecoach with you. He's an Easterner from Kansas City, Missouri. Kansas City, Kansas, brother. Your health, Reverend. <clears throat> I'm not a clergyman. My name is Peacock. I'm a... He's a whiskey drummer. What? Are you, Mr. Haycock? I, Haycock. Oh, tell me, sir. I know, I know a familiar name and a non a name. I never forget a face or a friend. <laughs> Sepples? Hmm. <sighs> right. <laughs> well, Granny! Thank you. 
dollars, Henry. Certainly, my dear, certainly. Well, what is it to be this time, my dear? A fair of I food? want to pay the butcher. Dinner's at 12 o'clock. Don't worry, my dear, I'll be there. I've invited the ladies of the Law and Order League. All aboard for Dry Fork, Apache Wells, Lee Ferry, Hartsburg. I'll take that, Dallas. Oh, thanks. In you go, Dallas, and a pleasant voyage. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Shirley, my kingo. Carry it with honor. I'll take it, doctor. Oh, no, no, no trouble at all. No trouble at all. I'll carry it on my lap. Here we go. Here we go, Reverend. Mrs. Whitney, you're not going to let your friend travel with that creature. She's right, Lucy. And besides, you're not well enough to travel. It's only a few hours, Nancy. I'm quite all right. But you shouldn't travel a step without a doctor. There is a doctor, dear. The driver told me. Doctor? Doc Boone? He couldn't doctor a horse. Now, Lucy, darling, you must be very careful. Take good care of yourself. Oh, dear, I'm what's that now? Maybe folks ride face and forward, please. There you go. Pleasant journey, Mrs. Mallory. Thank you. Goodbye. 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 Like an angel in the jungle. A very wild jungle. What are you doing, Hatfield? Talking to yourself? You wouldn't understand, cowboy. You've never seen an angel, nor a gentlewoman, nor a great lady. I raise gentlemen. Well, so long, Buck. So long, Curly. Nice trip, boy. So long, so long, kids. Wait a minute. Hold up there, Buck. Grab your recovery. Steady, girl. Captain Sickles asked if you to deliver this dispatch in Lordsburg the moment you arrive. The telegraph line has been cut. Sure. We're going with you as far as the noon station at Dry Fork. There'll be a troop of cavalry there, and they'll take you on to Apache Wells. From Apache Wells, you'll have another escort of soldiers into Lordsburg. But you must warn your passengers that they travel at their own risk. At their own risk? Well, what's the trouble, Lieutenant? Geronimo. Geronimo? Well, then I ain't Will you so... sit down? Of course, the Army has no authority over you, gentlemen. If you think it's unsafe to make the trip... This stage is going to Lordsburg. If you think it ain't safe to ride along with us, I figure we can get there without you, soldier boys. I have my orders, sir. And I always obey orders. Oh. Did you all hear what the Lieutenant said? Yes, we heard. Well, me and Buck are taking this coach through, passengers or not. Now, whoever wants to get out can get out. It's courage, courage, Reverend. Ladies first. Excuse me. How about you, Dallas? What are you trying to do, scare somebody? They got me in here, and I'll let them try to put me out. The worst things in Apaches. If you'll take my advice, ma'am, you won't take this trip. My husband is with his troops in Dry Fork. If he's in danger, I want to be with him. <clears throat> you see, brother, I have a wife and five children. Then you're a man. Hands. By all the powers that be, Reverend, you're a man. All right, folks. <clears throat> Marshal, make room for one more. I'm offering my protection to this lady. I can shoot fairly straight if there's need for it. That's been proved too many times, Hatfield. All right, get in. We're late. Now, tell me to move over, sir. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Close the door. Oh, Curly, we Get shouldn't... going, Buck. Oh, Bessie, Brownie, Bill! Farewell, ladies. Ah, sweetheart! Goodbye. Come on now, girl. <laughs> Go on to Lord's 
I've just got a telegram. Better stop to pack this bag. Oh, get that. Oh, I got it. Now, here, thirsty, fighting, fighting, Country. Funny catching Gatewood outside of town that way. I just took this job ten years ago so I could make enough money to marry my Mexican girl, Julieta, and I've been working hard at it ever since. Bonnie, get over! Oh! All right. Well, certainly. My wife's got more relatives than anyone you ever did see. I bet I'm feeding half the state of Chihuahua. Sweetheart! That seemed funny to you about Gatewood? Yeah, and then what do I get to eat when I get home in Lordsburg? Nothing but free holy beans, that's all. Nothing but beans, beans, beans. Fancy, Bonnie, Blackie, girl, now get off! Uh, excuse me, ladies. <laughs> Most quarters. Uh, warm today. Your wife made it warm for me, Gilman. She was chairman of our farewell committee. <clears throat> Fine looking bunch of soldier boys back there. Always gives me great pride in my country when I see such fine young men in the U.S. Army. Anybody know where they're going? <clears throat> Brother, aren't you aware of what's happened? Happened? I, I don't follow you, Reverend. I'm not a clergyman. I'm a... My friend's a whiskey drummer. We're all going to be scouted. Massacred in one fell swoop. That's why the soldiers are with us. He's joking, of course. Oh, no, he's not. Oh, dear, no. I wish he were. It's that old Apache butcher, Geronimo. Geronimo. Nice name for a butcher. He's jumped the reservation. It's on the wall plan. Geronimo? Why weren't the pastors notified? Why wasn't I told? We, we were told, Gabriel. Yes. Weren't you told when you got that message from Morsberg? Oh, yes, 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 of course, I, I forgot. Doggone it, they're bringing up her grandfather all the way from Mexico to live with us. I can't figure out how he got that message. Who, her grandfather? No, Gatewood. Sweetheart! He said he got a message. Sweetheart! The telegraph line ain't working. Sweetheart! It's Ringo. Yeah. Hello, kid. Hello, Curly. Hi, uh, Buck. How's your folks? Oh, just fine, Ringo, except my grandfather came Shut up. Shut up. Didn't expect to see you riding shotgun on this run, Marshal. Going to Lordsburg? I figured you'd be there by this time. No. Lame horse. Well, it looks like you've got another passenger. Yeah. I'll take the Winchester. You may need me in this Winchester, Curly. Saw a ranch house burning last night. You don't understand, kid. You're under arrest. Curly. Is everything all right, Marshal? 
Everything's all right, Lieutenant. Hope I ain't crowding you folks none. Oh, Don't bother, Mary. Friday, 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 Fine boy. I think so. Hey, you're just smart in a trade rat. You knew all the time he was going to Lordsburg. Hey, reckon what he meant. He saw ranch houses burning. Hatches. So you're the notorious Ringo kid. My friends just call me Ringo. Nickname I had as a kid. Right name's Henry. Seems to me I knew your family, Henry. Didn't I fix your arm once when you uh, bucked off a horse? Are you Doc Boone? I certainly am. Now, let's see. I'd just been honorably discharged from the Union Army after the War of the Rebellion. You mean the war for the Southern Confederacy, sir? I mean nothing of the kind, sir. That was my kid brother broke his arm. You did a good job, Doc. Even if you was drunk. Thank you, son. Professional compliments are always pleasing. Yes, they are. What happened to that boy whose arm I fixed? He was murdered. Cigar. You're annoying this lady. Excuse me, madam. Being so partial to the weed myself, I sometimes forget that it disagrees with others. A gentleman doesn't smoke in the presence of a lady. Three weeks ago, I took a bullet out of a man who was shot by a gentleman. The bullet was in his back. You mean to insinuate... Sit down, mister. Doc don't mean no harm. Captain Mallory. I was told he was here. Well, dearie, got orders not to afford us to join the soldiers at Apache Wells. Well, that means we gotta go back. I can't go back. Now, look here, driver, you started this coach for Lordsburg, and it's your duty to get us there. And it's your duty, young man, to come along with us. It's my duty, Mr. Gatewood, to obey orders. I'm sorry, sir. Well, well if the soldiers go back, Lieutenant, that, that means we all have to go back. 
My orders are to return from here immediately. And I can't disobey those orders. I think we can get through all right, Curly. Oh, now don't egg him on, kid. I'm driving this here outfit, and, well, if the soldiers go back, so am I. I call this a desertion of duty. I'll report you to your superior officer. And if necessary, I'll take the matter up with Washington. That's your privilege, sir. But if you give us any trouble here, I'll have to put you under restraint. Now, don't lose your temper. Don't lose your temper. I'll tell you how we settle it. We'll take a vote. Inside, everybody. Come on, Buck. Oh, but Curly, I don't want to... Now, you girls, set yourselves down. I'll get you some feet. Now, folks, if we push on, we can be in Apache Wells by sundown. Soldiers there will give us an escort as far as the ferry. Then it's only a hoot and a holler into Lordsburg. Well, that old mayor, we I got don't four think... men can handle firearms. Five with you, Ringo. Doc can shoot if sober. I can shoot. I can shoot. Now, Miss Mallory, I, I ain't gonna put a lady in danger without she votes for it. I've traveled all the way here from Virginia. I'm determined to get to my husband. I won't be separated any longer. What's your vote, mister? <laughs> Where's your manners, Curly? Aren't you gonna ask the other lady first? Well, what do you say? What difference does it make? It doesn't matter. I vote that we go on. I demand it. I'm standing on my legal rights. What do you say, Hatfield? Lordsburg? Four. You, Doc? I'm not only a philosopher, sir. I'm a fatalist. Somewhere, sometime, there may be the right bullet or the wrong bottle waiting for Josiah Bull. Why worry when or where? Yes or no? Having that philosophy, sir, I've always caught a danger. During the late war, when I had the honor to serve the Union under our great president, Abraham Lincoln, ah, and General Phil Sheridan, well, sir, I fought mid shot and shell and cannon raw. Do you want to go back or not? No. I want another drink. <laughs> That's five. How about you, Mr. Hancock? Peacock. <clears throat> I'd like to go on, brother. I want to reach the bosom of my dear family in Kansas City, Kansas, as quickly as possible. But I may never reach that bosom if we go on. So, under the circumstances, you understand, brother, I think it best we go back with the bosoms. I mean, the soldiers. One against. Well, Buck? I was... Buck says I. That's six. I'm voting your proxy, kid. You go with me. Ain't nothing keeping me out of Lordsburg, Curly. There sure ain't. Well, folks, that settles it. We're going through. Sit down, folks, and eat your grub. Come on, Buck. We'll change them horses. No, oh, but Curly, ain't we going to eat? We'll eat later. Oh. Here you are, folks. Food's on the table. Help yourselves. You've got a long ride out of you. You ain't drinking, Billy. Sit down here, ma'am. Thanks. I find you another place, Mrs. Mallory. It's cooler by the window. Thank you. Looks like I got the plague, don't it? No, no, it's not you. Well, I guess you can't break out of prison and into society in the same week. Please. Please. Your illness. 
Mrs. Mallory. No, it's just that I... I'll be all right. You've been very kind. Why? In the world I live in, one doesn't often meet a lady, Mrs. Mallory. Have you ever been in Virginia? I was in your father's regiment. I should remember your name. You're Mr. Hatfield. That's what I'm called, yes. Why do you look at me like that? I'm just trying to remember. Ain't I seen you someplace before, ma'am? No. No, you haven't. Hmm. I wish I had, though. <laughs> I know you. I mean, I know who you are. I guess everybody in the territory does. Yeah. Well, I used to be a good cow hand, but things happen. Yeah, that's it. Things happen. And now they'll take you back to prison. Not till I finish a job in Lordsburg. But you can't. You're going there as a prisoner. All aboard for Apache Wells. Leave. All right, folks. The horses are changed. We'd better get going. In Lordsburg, maybe. All right, get going, Ringo. Mrs. Pickett, tell Billy that the boat is all ready. Let's get going. All right, Marshal. We're ready.
Reduce taxes. Our national debt is something shocking. Over one billion dollars a year. What this country needs is a businessman for president. What this country needs is more fuddle. What? Fuddle. You're done, sir. I'm happy, great one. Who? How come you're taking this road? It's going to be cold up there. I'm using my hand. Those breech crowd Apaches don't like snow. To, to sit next to me, I you could put your head on my shoulder. No, thank you. How are you feeling, Mrs. Mallory? Is there any water? Ivan. Canteen, please. Just a minute, Mrs. Mallory. I've seen this crest before. Isn't this from Greenfield Manor? I wouldn't know, Mrs. Mallory. I won this cup on a wager. How about the other lady? Thanks. No silver cups. This is fun.
Folks, if I deed, Chris, while we change horses, we're pushing right on to Lordsburg. You come with the hard soldiers? Oh, we weren't as scared. We didn't see one Apache, did we, Curly? Where's the cavalry, Chris? Uh -huh. Where's the soldiers? There ain't no soldiers. Huh? Soldiers are gone. Where's Captain Mallory? Where's my husband? Where is he? You, his wife, I think? Yes, where is he? Did he go with his men? Si, senora. A little what you call a skirmish with the Apaches last night. Soldiers take Captain Morales to Lordsburg. I think he'd get hurt, maybe. Badly? Si, senora. I think so. Mrs. Mallory. I'm awfully sorry. If, if there's anything I'm I could... quite all right, thank you. Come on, Doc. Let's go, Doc. A sick woman on our hands. That's all we needed. Oh, I feel kind of sick. Well, we're in a fine fix, my friends. It's a fine country we're living in. The Army has no right to leave a public place like this undefended. Looks to me like the Army's got its hands pretty full, mister. You Si, senor, I think. Call her. Yakima, don't start. Ringo, go in the kitchen and get some hot water. Lots of hot water, please. Yes, ma'am. Hey, Chris. Don't do that, Costina. Aquí está, kid. A fine member of the medical profession. Drunken beast. Coffee. Give me coffee. Black coffee. Lots of it. More, more. Got enough more. Got more. Black or stronger. Keep it coming. I know you'll right. have it coming out Come your on. ears in a minute. Get it down. I'll drink Go it down, Doc. Go on. Drink it down. Get it down. That'll Come make on. you feel better. All right, Doc. Isn't that drunken swine forward yet? He's doing the best he can. Well, hurry! Tomorrow. Chin horn. Fine. Fine. Thanks. Again. Sit down here, Doc. Keep the fire going, Chris. Plenty of hot water. This ain't your seat. Savage! That's my wife, Yakima, my squaw. Yes, but she's... she's savage. Si, senor. She's a little bit savage, I think. Ándale pronto a calentar agua, a la enferma. Pronto. Something funny about this. That woman's an Apache. Sure, she's one of Geronimo's people. I think 
Maybe not so bad to have a Apache wife, eh? Apache don't bother me, I think. All right, Doc. Al pensar en ti, tierra en que nací, que nostalgia siente mi corazón. En mi soledad, con este cantar, Siento alivio y consuelo en mi dolor. Ahora muchachos, váyanse. Las notas tristes de esta canción me traen recuerdos de aquel amor. Al pensar en él vuelve a renacer la alegría en mi triste corazón. the carols, they've run away. Yeah, with the spare horses. Coyotes give me the creeps. It sounds well. It sounds just like a baby. Black ape. It's a baby. It's a little girl. It's a little girl. Well, I'll be doggone. Why didn't somebody tell me? I was Mrs. Manray. She's going to be all right. Well, I'll be doggone. D did you know? Don't do that. Dr. Boone. boys. Three cheers for old Doc Boone. Hip, hip! Quiet. Well, we ought to be... Quiet. Mrs. Mallory. 
I know why you want to go to Losburg. I like you. I know you, Pop. She was a good friend of mine. If you know who in Losburg, you stay away, I think. You mean Luke Plummer? Luke, I can hate. All there together. I saw them. You sure of that, Chris? Sure. I can tell you the truth. I know. Thanks. That's all I wanted to know. Say, you crazy if you go. I think you stay awake here. Three against one is no good. Why don't you make for the quarter now? My father and brother were shot down by the plumber boy. I guess you don't know how it feels to lose your own folks that way. I lost mine when I was a kid. It was a massacre in Superstition Mountain. That's tough. Especially on a girl. Well, you gotta live no matter what happens. Yeah, that's it. Look, Miss Dallas, you got no folks. Neither have I, and, well, maybe I'm taking a lot for granted, but I watched you with that baby, that other woman's baby. You look, well, well, I still got a ranch across the border, and it's a nice place, a real nice place. Trees, grass, water. There's a cabin half built. A man could live there. A woman. There you go. But you don't know me. You don't know who I am. I know all I want to know. There you go. Oh, don't talk like that. What are you doing out here, kid? Stick close to the reservation. Katie! Oh, Katie! Oh! Katie! Katie! What's wrong, Chris? My wife, Yakima, she ran away. When I went up, she was gone. The way you come busting in here, you think we... Whoa. Excuse me, kid. Come busting in here, you think we were being attacked. You can find another wife. Sure, I can find another wife. But you take my rifle and my horse. Oh, I never sell her. I love her so much. She, I beat her with a whip, and she never get tired. Your wife? No, my horse. Oh. I can find another wife easy, yes. But not a horse like that. Mala Yakima. I knew that woman was a thief. I... What's the matter with you, Gatewood? My police. Where's my police? Which one of you got it? Here it is. I was using it for a pillow. I didn't think you'd I told you to keep your hands off my things. Yes, sir. That squire of yours will find some Apaches and bring them back here. My wife, people don't bother me, I think. Well, bother me, I think. Chris, is this bar open? Sure, all the times in your scene. Good. Here you are, Duck. Well, what are you wasting time for? Let's make a break for it. We've got a sick woman to pick up. You want her to stay here and be butchered with the rest of us? Why don't you think of somebody else for once? You need that. Easy, easy. easy. Keep it quiet, boys. Quiet. We ain't been butchered yet. But you're right. We better get going for Lordsburg as soon as we can. Might be a good idea, Curly, if uh, Doc took a look at the patient. Yeah, and little coyote. 
You will join me, Doctor? <clears throat> no, thanks. Morning. Well, you're looking pretty chipper. You're up early, Dallas. She didn't go to bed, Doctor. I'm afraid she sat up all night while I slept. Oh, I slept a lot in the chair. Well, anyway, it was nice to stay awake and hold the baby. <laughs> well, we've got to get you to Lordsburg, little coyote. <laughs> That's what the boys christened her last night when she squalled. Little coyote. How do you feel? Oh, fine, thanks. I'm a little tired. Doctor, do you think my husband... Never mind him. The best medicine he can have is to see you two safe and sound. You just make up your mind you're going to get there. I have made up my mind. That's the stuff. I am going to get there. You need strength, so get all the rest you can. Dallas, you suppose you can fix up a little broth? She has already. Good. How about making some coffee for the boys? Now, you get some sleep, Mrs. Mallory. Don't look so proud. I brought hundreds of those little fellows into the world. Once upon a time. And the new one was always the prettiest. Doc. Ringo asked me to marry him. Is that wrong for a girl like me? If a man and a woman love each other, it's all right, ain't it, Doc? You're going to be her child. Worse than you've ever been hurt. Don't you know that boy's headed back for prison? Besides, if you two go in the Lordsburg together, He's got to know all about you. He's not going into Lordsburg. All I want is for you to tell me it's all right. Gosh, child, who am I to tell you what's right or wrong? All right. Go ahead. Do it if you can. Good luck. Thanks, Doc. Ringo. Hello, Doc. Oh, uh, both doing nicely. She's a real soldier's wife, that young lady. Good, good. Then we can leave immediately. Well, not for a day or so, if you want my professional advice. What do you mean, a day? Stay another day? Why? Where were you when the stork came last night, Gatewood? I refuse to allow Mrs. Mallory to travel until she and the child are out of danger. What do you mean, danger? Aren't we in worse danger here? <clears throat> I don't wish to intrude, but I've had five children. I mean, my dear wife has. And much as I dislike discussing it in this hour of our trial, I, I believe the doctor's right. Spoken like a man, Reverend. I say we ought to leave here before the Apache finds us. That's common sense. I wish you were ten years younger, Gatewood. Don't let my white hair stop you. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, Curly, I haven't said a word. Will you shut up? Now, if we argue this thing out right, we can get somewhere. Let's all sit down and talk sensible. Come on, Buck, sit down. There's a young woman in the kitchen making coffee. She needs help. Thanks, Doc. Say, kid, how old were you when you went to the pen? Oh, I was going on 17. Most of the night. Wondering what you'd have said if 
Curly hadn't busted you. Guess you was up kind of late, too. Here you're moving around. You didn't answer what I asked you last night. Look, kid, why don't you try to escape? There's a horse out there in the corral. Curly won't go after you because he can't leave the passengers in the fix like this. I gotta go to Lordsburg. Why don't you go to my ranch and wait for me? Wait for a dead man. Haven't got a chance. It was three against one when the plumber swore that you killed their foreman. So that just sent up. It'll be three against one in Lordsburg. Well, there's some things a man just can't run away from. How can you talk about your life and my life when you're throwing them away? Yeah, mine too. That's what you're throwing away if you go to Lordsburg. What do you want me to do? Would it make us any happier if Luke Plummer was dead? One of his brothers would be after you with a gun. We'd never be safe. I don't want that kind of life, Ringo. Well, I don't see what else I can do. Go now. Get away. Forget Lordsburg. Forget the plumbers. Make for the border and I'll come to you. Do you mean that? Yes, I do. Will you go with me, Dallas? Oh, I can't leave Mrs. Mallory and the baby. I'll come to you from Lordsburg, I swear it. I'll have a rifle. I've got one. Right here. I got it last night when they were all asleep. You mean you thought of this last night? Yeah, don't ask any more questions. Not now. Oh, gosh, Curly, there ain't no Apaches behind us. We can still go back to Tonto. No, I insist we go on to Lordsburg. What do you think, Chris? Geronimo, between here and Lordsburg, with my horse, I think. <laughs> My horse no, has doctor. gone, she oh. has gone Quiet. astray with the sun. Quiet, Doc, this is a serious matter, ain't it? My dear Buck, if I have only one hour to live, I'm going to enjoy myself. Doctor, I don't begrudge you my samples. But now I you hush, it. I've stood what enough for you. Now this is a serious problem, and I'm the only one that's talking sense. Now, Curly... If we can get across that ferry, we'll be all right. The question is, what are we going to do about the lady and her baby? Dr. Boone has settled that for us, sir. And I demand respect for his professional opinion. Hatfield. Ringo. Ringo! Ringo! Hurry, Ringo. Ringo! Hurry! Bye-bye. I'll see you, wait. Look at them hills. Patches. War signals. signs of them. They strike like rattlesnakes. If you hadn't insisted on waiting for her, we'd have been across the ferry by this time. You talk too much, Gatewood. Your threats don't faze me, Hatfield. 
You're nothing but a tin horn gambler. How would you like to get out and walk? You can't put me out of a public conveyance. Now, now, gentlemen, gentlemen. Take it easy, Gatewood. We may need that fight before we get to the ferry. You wouldn't be much good enough to fight you, jailbird. Oh, leave the kid alone. He's handcuffed. Gentlemen, please, let's not forget the ladies. Bless them. Let's have a little Christian charity, one for the other. to escape again? I'll give you my word. The Lordsburg. Get in the coach with them women. I am my word. Ringo, don't! Hey, Salas! Huck, drive into the river up to the hubs! Ronnie, Bessie! Bessie! the saddle, kid. Ready, kid? All set. Ready, Buck? feelings, I hope. <clears throat> all in all, it's been exciting, but a very interesting trip, has it not? Well, now that the danger's passed, Mr. Peacock, and ladies and gentlemen, since it's most unlikely that we'll ever have the pleasure of meeting again socially, I'd like to propose a toast. Major? Gatewood? Ringo? Your help. Thank, Thank you, sir.
you shut up, you fool! I've got a patient here! Stop me! Get me out of here! I tell you! Will you shut up? Take him!
If you see Judge Rainfield, tell him his son. Thank heaven you're safe, Lucy. Where's Richard? Is he all right? Oh, he's all right. Don't you worry. It isn't a bad wound. We'll take you to him immediately. Where's the baby, dear? I'll take the baby. Is there anything I can do for? I know. Waterley. Rico kid. Aces and eights. Dead man's hand, Luke. Rico kids in town? Yeah, drive on the stage. Manos. Si, patron. Un momento. Cash in. Hi, Miss Dallas. If you ever come to Kansas City, Kansas, I want you to come out to see us. Oh, thanks, Mr. Uh... Peacock. Right, 
folks. You're all right. Unload. Here you are, Doctor. Will you sign this? Well, Lordsburg. Thank you. And you, Doctor. There you are. Thank you. Well, kid. Curly, uh, how long will they give me for breaking up? Oh, about another year. You know where my ranch is? Yeah. Will you uh, see that she gets there all right? Dallas. Yeah. This is no town for a girl like her. Will you do it? Sure. Thanks. All right, Marshal. Get my man through all right? I don't need them. If you don't want to lose your prisoner, Sheriff, you'd better take care of him yourself. What's your name, mister? My name is Gatewood, Ellsworth H. Gatewood. Oh, Gatewood. You didn't think they'd have the telegraph wires fixed, did you? You are not here. Gatewood, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll meet you back here in 10 minutes. I gave you my word, Curly. I ain't going back on it now. No ammunition. I lied to you, Curly. Got three left. Good night, kid. Is this where you live? No. I gotta know where you live, don't I? No, don't come any further. You're hoping a crazy dream. I've been out of my mind just hoping. Say goodbye here, kid. We well, ain't never gonna say goodbye. I have that. Give me the shotgun. Shotgun! Lou, Lou, please don't. 
Well, kid, I, I told you not to follow me. Dallas. I asked you to marry me, didn't I? Never forget to ask me, kid. That's help me. Wait here. Come along! Uh, uh, Ringo said he'll be passing this way in six or seven minutes. Take that shotgun, Luke. You'll take it in the belly if you don't get out of my way. I'll have you indicted for murder if you step outside with that shotgun. We'll attend to you later. Do that again. Luke! Hey, Billy! Billy, tell that story about the Republican convention in Chicago and take this down. The Ringo Kid was killed on Main Street in Lordsburg tonight. And among the additional dead were. I'll leave that blank for a spell. I didn't hear any shoot lead. You will, Billy. You will. <laughs> I missed him at four feet. Oh, my.
Ready, kid? Thanks, Curly. Curly's gonna see that you can get to my place across the border. Bye, Dallas. Bye. Maybe you'd like to ride a ways with a kid. Please. Blessings of civilization? Yeah. <laughs> Doc? I'll uh, buy you a drink. Just one. 